Hi, everyone. I want to do my lecture over oral and maxillofacial surgery. So I want to start by saying I recorded the last two sections when we first went on quarantine in March with a different class. So I wanted to record just the first couple pages just so you could see the slideshow and be able to follow along with the rest of the lectures with my slideshow. So this is our oral and maxillofacial surgery, chapter 18, and we're starting on page 699. So first of all, I wanna say that oral maxillofacial surgery is very cool. There's a lot of oral script texts that are private script texts. So they stay with their surgeon, they go wherever they go. They don't necessarily work for a hospital, they just work for that surgeon. So you'll have that opportunity if you're interested in that in the future. But because of that, you'll have less of this at extern, probably than any other specialty. So you'll only be doing a little bit of oral and maxillofacial surgery if you're lucky. So this isn't one you're going to want to memorize every single instrument. This is one you want to understand the concepts and what they're doing, especially when it comes to dirty versus clean on these procedures. So let me just start. with the anatomy there. <laughs> so there is your tooth anatomy. It hits it later in the chapter, but I wanted to include that picture in the beginning so you could get a good review of this anatomy. So I really wanna start with diagnostic tests. So on page 699, it really gets into the different x-rays. I want you to look more toward the bottom of the page for a moment. So the first x-ray it talks about is the Walters view, and then later on the Caldwell's view. So I just want you to find those terms and highlight them first so then you can follow along with me. So here's a picture for you, your Walters view. So this one is requiring your patient to have a hyperextended neck, but it's allowing us to really see some details. So it says specifically on page 699, infraorbital rims, frontal and maxillary sinuses, the alveolar arch, and the zygomas are going to be really well observed with the Walters view. Because the Caldwell and Walters view are so similar, make sure you catch the differences. So on the Caldwell view, this one is going to show the hard palate, the nasal septum, the orbital floor, and the zygoma very well. This next one, I don't have a picture of it for you, but it's a little bit different. And I want you to understand one main point. So basal view, this one is going to be best at showing zygomatic fractures. That's why there's not an included picture because just for zygomatic fractures. After that, it goes over a panoramic x-ray. I'm sure you've all had this at the dental office, but here's an image for you so you can better understand the panoramic x-ray. This is gonna show on the film the alveolar processes, the mandible and the posterior maxillary sinuses and the zygomas. So really go through these x-rays, understand what you're gonna see on each different view. After that, on the last paragraph, it just talks about CT scans. I just want you to be aware that we're gonna do CT scans to see some of these structures and better understand the planes. On page 700, there's another picture of your caudal view of the skull, if that helps you out. I want you to focus on where it says CT scans again. So just a reminder that we can have these in the operating room. So we'll have the picture up on a computer screen so that the surgeon can really plan out how they're going to do this procedure. Um, it also helps them keep track of where they are and just verify before they make cuts and moves. So the CT scan will be projected on a computer screen and also they can use models to help plan how they're gonna do the surgery. So I have one of those models myself from a maxillofacial procedure, but it's pretty much plates and screws. So if they're putting on plates and screws, they might want a model to help them figure out how they're going to fix these defects. Okay, so after your x-rays and your images, let's look at tooth extraction endontectomy. So it tells you right from the beginning that you're going to have 
dental instruments and a basic plastic instrument tray. I want to point out if you're just removing teeth, it's going to be all of these on the side, all of these dental extraction tools that I go through some of in your lecture. If it's more maxillofacial, then you might need that basic plastic instrument set. Uh, read through your routine supplies, but I want you to see that you need that anti-fog solution. So you might need a laryngeal mirror to put into the mouth so they can see certain sections of the tooth, and it's going to fog up very easily from the patient's breath. So you need to put anti-fog solution on this laryngeal mirror so they can see back in the mouth very easily. After that, let's look at your procedural considerations, and I want you to pay attention to the positioning. So for these oral maxillofacial cases. The patient is going to be in supine, and they're also going to have their head tilted back to provide that exposure. If they need more exposure, they're going to put a towel roll and place it to extend the neck. If they ever put it right under the shoulders and near the armpits, they're going to call that an axillary roll, and it does help extend the neck back. But for this one, just know roll towel may be placed in aid sliding, extending the neck. On 701, it starts going into your instruments. So you can read through that to see what all is in your trays. I want you to pay more attention to the bottom, your mouth props. We're going to need these to keep the mouth open for dental procedures. And then the plastic cheek retractor is for multiple different procedures, but a lot of surgeons call this a smile maker because it's going to make you smile. After that, you'll see one last instrument that's very important on page 702. This is a Minnesota retractor. So you'll use this on every dental case in the intraoral case also. So how it's typically described is a double angled retractor that's used for oral surgery. So they can stick the pointy end inside the mouth to pull back some of the cheek, or they can use that lip on the other end to just gently retract the cheek back. So you might be holding one of these as your passing instrument. Looking next to that Minnesota retractor picture, I want you to pay attention to the positioning. So the arms are going to be tucked. Anytime the arms are tucked, you need to protect those ulnar nerves. So you'll have extra padding to protect the elbows before we tuck in the patient arm. The patient prep may not be included at all for oral procedures. So I want you to read down and find where it says, brush your teeth in oral antiseptic. Yes, that means we will be brushing teeth in the operating room. So they typically pour you a little bit of what's called Paradex. So Paradex is that oral antiseptic, and then they're gonna give you a non-sterile toothbrush You'll just stick it in the paradex and the surgeon will basically brush the patient's teeth before getting going and will suck up any of that paradex that's in the patient's mouth. So this is just allowing it to be a little bit cleaner, even though, again, it is a non-sterile, dirty procedure. Okay, and the last bullet point talks about the throat pack. I want you to really read the Pearl of Wisdom on the next couple pages that talks about it, but a throat pack is just gonna be a ray tech that we are going to use to cover the pharynx. So think about we're drilling, we're taking teeth out, there's lots of irrigation and oral secretions and blood happening. We don't want any of that to get lodged into the throat. So we're putting a Raytec or a throat pack to cover the pharynx so we don't get any of these um, debris or blood lodged in the pharynx. So this is just to protect your patient. This will always be removed before extubation. That is why we do our count. So you're responsible for making sure that throat pack is removed. Okay, after that, the procedure, tooth extraction and odontectomy. I will flip back to my anatomy picture for this. So tooth extraction, it talks about your terms that you learned in anatomy. So it should be a little bit of review for you. So Pretty simple, your cheek side is the buccal side and the tongue side is the lingual side. So see, think very simply when reviewing this anatomy. Um, other examples, go over the types of teeth. 
like incisors versus bicuspids and molars. So example, your incisors are just your four front teeth used to tear up your food. So review over your types of teeth and then go over the regions. So that's what I have pictured here on the right. You need to know the crown, the root, and the neck for this test. So go over that anatomy and you should be prepared for the oral anatomy section. Okay, your last bullet point on page 702, on dentectomy, I want you to understand what this involves. So resection of soft tissue and excision of the bone surrounding the tooth prior to removal of the tooth. So this is only done when the tooth is impacted. That's why we're having to cut and drill around and take other tissue and bone. Because this is such a simple procedure, I won't go through it step by step. I will say read through it. I want to stop on number four on page 703. Number four. So just a reminder that they will be injecting local anesthetic. It usually has epinephrine when we're working in the mouth. So this helps with hemostasis and controlling the bleeding. So make sure that your surgeon is telling the anesthesia provider, hey, I'm injecting local with epinephrine. So just a reminder for you real quick, when you pass over your local anesthetic at the beginning of the procedure, you want to repeat what the medication is. So you pass it over. I'll give you an example. You'll say this is half percent lidocaine with epinephrine. So that means that anesthesia is going to hear that. And if they see anything change on their monitors, they'll understand why, because we just injected epinephrine. Flip it over to page 704. Looking at number nine is what I told you before. The tooth is scheduled for extraction. And if it's impacted, they're going to do the endontectomy. So that is why we're doing an endontectomy because the tooth is impacted. Because of that, you will need a dental drill. So look at number 11. You must have a dental drill to get these pieces out. I wanna point out you'll need suction and irrigation every time that drill is used. So we don't want to burn the bone. That's the term they typically use. So we're, you could hurt or damage the cells in that bone. So we want to drill through it with lots of irrigation and, of course, suction to catch all that irrigation so it's not going down the patient's throat. And number 12, the tooth may be removed as whole, but if it can't be, that's why you have that dental drill. You can split it in half and take it out in sections. Okay, the rest of that I think you should read through. I want to point out your wound classification on this one. It is a class two clean contaminated because we are inside the mouth. And then lastly, your pearl of wisdom, make sure you read all the way through it. I already told you it's a ray tech that we're going to put inside of the throat so we don't get any of that bone debris in our pharynx. But I want to add also, you need to remember to take it out. So the trick that I was taught was to put a tonsil or a schnitt clamped on the edge of my mayo stand, like hanging off the edge onto the patient drape. This is a reminder for everybody that's scrubbed in to grab that tonsil clamp and get that ray tech out of the throat at the end of the procedure. So of course you're gonna do a count, you'll keep track of your sponges, but it's just another indicator to everyone scrubbed in it's basically saying, hey, there's a throat pack in, don't forget to take it out. So just clamp that tonsil or schnitt to the side of your mayo stand and have it lay on the drape, which is on top of your patient. Okay, so the rest of my lecture starts on page 705. So make sure you're using the slideshow as you go through the rest of it, because as I said, I did it a long time ago and I didn't do it with our slideshow. So it's just me talking to you. So. Make sure if you have any questions about this chapter, you send me a message. I'm happy to help, help you. You can also post it in our discussion board. So you might hear me say things like my course connection or put your comments under the lecture because these are old recorded lectures. So I just want to remind you to use the discussion board, Facebook Messenger, or email me. I'm here to help you while learning online.